Loving God, may we give thanks in our hearts and through our lives. Amen. Every year at this time in the fall, my family prepares itself for a trip, a pilgrimage, in fact, to California to make our way through the verdant and bucolic charm of the Los Angeles urban sprawl. <laughs> no traffic, snarl up is too long. No thickness of smog too great. No horde of Black Friday shoppers hitting the stores on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving is too immense to deter us because we have a dinner to get to. I'm sure most of you will have your own tryst with destiny this coming week as we collectively undertake that most American of ritual behaviors to plan, cook, eat, and then analyze a meal with our nearest and dearest. Our own riff on that day's peculiar ritual has involved the same two extended families for over 40 years in a beautiful testament to friendship that has withstood the varied fortunes of those four decades, along with the proliferation of grandchildren and one or two great-grandchildren to boot. Even with all of our varied and sometimes tenuous connections to one another, after the meal is finally served in that no-man's land of a time hovering vaguely between lunch and dinner, somehow we manage to listen with grace and love as each of the 30-plus people share with everyone else what they want to give thanks for this year. As the food, in its resplendent glory, cools on the table. No matter how long it takes, or how I see the green bean speckled with bacon bits become, we don't seem to care. Because there just isn't anything that beats raw and heartfelt honesty around a table we only get to set but one time a year. Yet that day is not always so attentive to the best of what each of us has to offer. I've learned that in order to thrive as an immigrant in this country, it is better never to offer a straight answer to a crooked question on politics. For the politely phrased, what does your congregation think of the governor's race in Georgia? is anything but polite when said out loud. For no matter how carefully I answer, I know that what I'm going to say is going to be viewed through the lens of either CNN or Fox News or perhaps even worse, C-SPAN. Because truthfully, few of us really want to discuss politics with someone who actually knows what they're talking about. After all, the whole point of politics nowadays is to say whatever we want, no matter what we say bears a relation to reality. It might seem then that I am offering some pastoral direction here this morning that encourages you to avoid engaging in political dialogue over turkey and stuffing. Well, if that is so, then what else should we put on the watch list? As the old adage goes, conversation about sex or religion might be best avoided too, along with money and overly descriptive accounts of our personal health. In fact, if you are truly serious about keeping peace in the village this Thanksgiving, then my advice to you is to say nothing. Remain mute. You could even prepare some cards to hold up at various points during the day <laughs> to explain to your loved ones that in an age when teenagers can host their own TV shows on YouTube and everyone can become a journalist on Instagram or Twitter, you have decided not to add fuel to the fire. It is possible that I am exaggerating in the hope of making a point. 
that we live in a time where we would rather avoid real conversation, mostly because, collectively, we have forgotten how to disagree and to love at the same time. Email, Facebook, talk show radio, talking head television, and no end to the art of the monologue are doing something to our capacity to speak and to listen and to learn. For these three, speaking, listening, and learning, are meant to go together. What's more, in a time when we seem to hear Jesus' words reverberate on our news feeds on a daily basis of wars and rumors of wars, of nation against nation, our capacity to speak and to listen, yet more so to learn, seems to be hanging on by a thread. Given that this is the place that society appears to find itself in today, might we be bold enough to believe that there is something that we might offer for the good to such a world? For is not the church an opportunity for people to be formed in order to see and to listen to and to learn from the world around them from another perspective altogether? Not from the height of righteous certitude, but through the eyes of grace. Of course, because the church does not have the best track record when it comes to cultivating a sense of self-righteousness, it is important for us to take stock of our sense of altitude. I had the opportunity recently to visit the National Cathedral in Washington, from the roof of the cathedral, you can look out onto an expansive vista of the significant landmarks of our national life, the U.S. Capitol, the Washington Monument, and much of the vast machinery of government housed within the gleaming white of its neoclassical facades. It's a beautiful sight to behold, and easy to be tempted to think that somehow the church gets a place to stand in the world that can as does the cathedral, look over from above at the life of the so-called secular world below. Yet, as satisfying as it is to be able to stand on that roof and place your thumb between yourself and Congress, for example, a more faithful place to stand to see that world of politics and power is inside the cathedral at a small stained glass window whose colors weave in and out of an artist's rendition of those buildings of state. Standing there in the far more modest location of one window among a vast array of windows, it is possible to see something of the vocation that you and I share as people of the Christian faith, that we might learn to see the world through the experience of grace, in the knowledge that our longing for a transformed world begins in the recognition of our own need for transformation. This community, these people, the call to honest relationship, to faithful and sacrificial living, all of the life of the church is the transformational ground upon which we are gifted the opportunity to prepare ourselves, not to avoid challenging conversations or heart-searching relationships, but to walk toward them. For to embrace a life that chooses to step forward into the hard spaces of authentic human living is to embrace the hope that is set before us in Christ Jesus, the one for whom not even death stood as an impediment for God to be fully God to us, as we are called to be fully human to God and to one another. Our scriptures this morning offer us glimpses into what authentic human living might look like, not comfortable, yet capable of hope. Take Hannah, who wept at the entrance to the temple, not with ostentatious loudness, but with quiet dignity 
and grief over the pain she carried in not being able to bear a child. <coughs> For even facing the barely emotionally intelligent Eli, convinced as he is that the woman must have been drinking, not sad. Hannah chooses to meet Eli where he is to be met and teach the man of religion that while he may struggle to hear the stirrings of the heart, the Lord their God did. And so offers the priest an opening for grace to expand his own view of the world, starting with her. Real transformation is hard and slow, and oftentimes not what we think we want. Yet, as Jesus is at pains to point out to his disciples in Mark's gospel this morning, it happens not by our avoidance of the hard conversation or the challenging relationship or the conflictual situation, but by our whole and open-hearted embrace of it. For to embrace hope is to struggle. It is to wrestle with the truth in God that presents itself to our lives, not in pristine and sterilized philosophical principles, but in messy and embodied human living. In your life and my life and the whole lot of us in this striving and stressed out world. So as we pass the peas this Thanksgiving, might we also challenge ourselves to find an opening for the real encounter of one beating heart inclined to another. Jesus promises that this is but the pangs, just the beginning of that slow birth of hope for the world God's love redeems. That sounds like something to give thanks for to me. Turkey, cranberries, grace upon grace. 